but um, I'm fancying Wagawama, but if you want to go somewhere else or... Yeah, you can't make noodle soup. I was down, but I made it to the top right now And I can pull a couple grand out my pocket right now And yeah, I'm so fly, I'm flyer than a rocket right now And all the games you play never stop right now I grew up on the bus I saw everybody watching I got diamonds on my chain I got diamonds on my watch Money moves off my shoes Come straight from my job now Number 20 and um, for me podcast number 20 is uh, it's a big one I think we've had some amazing people on but probably without blowing too much smoke up your ass, <laughs> probably one of the biggest people we've got on uh, in our podcast history, which is Simon Brown, and an amazing story. And I just wanted to say thanks very much for coming today and, and doing a podcast with us, because Simon has been a busy guy yesterday, haven't you? You've uh, been a busy week, to be honest, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, up and down to London, but um, yeah, last night sleeping out, um, sleeping rough to raise awareness for homeless people in the, in the city, so it's... Uh, yeah, you know it's it's nice to do some put some back and you know if you do get a little bit of notoriety, use that for a good good cause. Absolutely, and um, I, uh, I I was um, we asked Simon to come on, but he's only just he's only just got back home about eleven o'clock. We've asked him to get changed. <laughs> yeah. We've um, we've took him to Wagamama's, didn't we? So we had an experience there, and um, I'm uh, I'm really excited to to hear your story. We've uh, put a few posts on uh, Facebook lately as well and um, it's just been a really, really good response but uh, it'd be just really good for me to just really start your story maybe from when you left school and maybe perhaps join the army. I think if we start from around that kind of time that'd be a really good start for me really, Simon. Um, so what made you get into what you did uh, and how was it in terms of the training and sort of the lead up to that as well? Yeah, so I mean, I joined the army at 18. Uh, I left school at sort of 16 after GCSEs. I tried college for a bit and it didn't really suit. I was never really an academic. Mm. So, um, you know, and I was doing sort of a bit of labouring, a bit of dead-end jobs. No, not that I had sort of uh, a valid future or career, you know, behind it. So, um, my dad were ex-forces and we sat down and had a chat and he said, look, you know, get, get, get a grip or, or, you know, sort yourself out. So, I uh, went down the careers office and and joined the army and uh, so I signed up I went down I think it was around sort of October November time I went up to Glen Course in January uh, which is Scotland and I did all my physical tests and my medical and that and then I started basic training in um, sort of uh, May June time uh, uh, 1997 and yeah it was a uh, how old was he at that time if I you just, it? yeah I just turned 18 so I was you know um, yeah so I turned 18 in the sort of 96 mm. um, and then yeah so it was uh, it was 15 weeks basic training in Perth right and I, I remember it was first time really I'd gone anywhere on my own you know I tra trained out of London through London and, and mm. to get to, to a training camp and it was like you know, getting on the bus and, and then you get into camp and then it just all hell breaks loose you just everybody's shouting at you people pushing you about and you know you can't do an alt right but um, you know you soon get into rhythm and as hard as it was, I look back on it with a lot of fondness because, um, you know, it was the beginning of a journey that made me who I am. Mm. Do you find, um, sort of, did you have any expectations when you were going into the army in terms of what you thought it was going to be like to, to what it was in terms of the training or...? I went in a little bit open-minded, I think. Um, I mean, when I joined, there, there wasn't a lot going on in the world. Mm. Um, so, you know, the biggest thing that had happened was obviously the, the Gulf War in 91 that mm. I was aware of. Um, I'm old enough to remember the Falklands um, and there was there was peacekeeping missions going on in Bosnia yeah. so there wasn't a huge amount going on around the yeah. world at the time so there certainly wasn't that media awareness of what the dangers were of being yeah. in the military um, but I joined at RIMI which is Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineer so I went in with the idea of getting a trade uh, you know mm. to be a mechanic um, yeah so I I'll be honest whatever expectations I may have had I was wrong <laughs> you know what I mean uh, just just it was, it was just, you know, like, like you imagine, you know, watching Bad Lads Army, you know, you're up in the morning, you shout at that because you've done everything wrong again. Yeah. Uh, then you messed about, you know, you do your physical training, but then there's a lot of education in it, you know, it's not just yeah. about learning to run and learning to shoot, there's so much more that you do. Mm. And when you say learning to shoot, when, what was it like when you learned how to shoot for the first time? I've never had a gun in my hand, I've never shot one. 
but they say it's like a bit of a strange feeling and they're usually a lot heavier than you think when you shoot them is that right yeah they are like you said the first time you sort of uh, handle it and you know you, you do quite a lot of lessons just with the safety and handling before, the, before like anywhere near bullets um, but, but then like I say when you go on the range and I think the biggest thing is they tell you constantly when you find a weapon you've got to really jam it in your shoulder because yeah. of the, the kick um, and if you get that wrong you know it, it hurts you know mm -hmm. and, and everybody that I think that uh, the first sort of first time I went to the range everybody had bruised shoulders because nobody held it properly but you, you soon learn and you get better and better at doing it and like I say, and then obviously, as your career develops, you might use different weapon systems and things like that. So it's, um, but yeah, it was a, uh, it, it was an interesting experience. And I think the, the weirdest thing is, is what you call, they've got what you call butts. So where the targets are, you'll be down one end where the targets lifting and lowering these these targets. And as you sat there, you, you're hearing all the rounds shooting all of your head, and it's that's the first time you feel if that thing hit me, you know, I'd be in bother. <laughs> so. <laughs> What about the physical side of it in terms of the fitness? Was that because you'd have been what you'd have been about eighteen at the time? Yeah. Were, you, were you actually fitting off it, or did you, do, when you go through the army training, do they kind of kick up your fitness and your strength for, to a certain level? Or is yeah, it, there's a definite expectation of, of, of a of a basic minimum to just to get there, yeah. and then and then once you've obviously once you've been training, you're training every day. You know, you're doing physical training every day, um, and there are mandatory tests that you have to pass at certain stages. Uh, so like when I did it, you, you had um, so you, it's called a BFT, basic fitness test. So you had to run a mile and a half as a squad in, in 15 minutes, and then it was a mile and a half individual effort, which had 10 and a half minutes. Um, and then you had to do a couple of different exercises, uh, sort of pull ups, you climb a rock, that sort of thing. Then you had your combat fitness test, which at the time was 25 kilos plus your weapon and helmet, uh, and that was an eight eight mile march. Uh, as a squad so you know and these but as I say you, you get used to it I mean for a lot of people there were people that had never really worn shoes so actually running in boots and things like that it was yeah. it was brand new to them so Crikey. but you, like you say you just you get used to it you do it all the time and it just becomes part of your daily routine Was it was there like a, a high fallout rate or were most people that were going in could pass the test or a lot of people struggled in the army in the training yeah, or? to be honest most of the people we lost from our platoon um, were injuries uh, it is hard training people get there. Um, mm. to, it's, in the first couple of weeks there'll probably be a few that get discharged so unfit for military service right. so um, you know they, they kind of get weeded out in the first couple of weeks um, and then once you get to a certain stage uh, everybody will generally pass and, unless like I say there's a serious injury involved ok good and so you, you, you've passed your, your training what was the what what was next then for Simon Brown? Was it did was you posted out or? So then I went to a place called Borden uh, in Hampshire, uh, not too far from Guildford, and that's where I did my trade training. So I, I learned to be a mechanic and sitting gills in mechanical engineering. Then after finishing that course, I was posted out to Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I did went to Germany in ninety uh, eight, okay, and then uh, at the beginning of ninety nine, I went on my first operational tour, which was in Kosovo. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, yeah, that kind of worked me up to the realis realism of, of what mm -hmm. conflict was, what the job as a soldier was, because it was, um, although it wasn't what you you do your class as a conventional war, emotionally and sort of uh, mentally, it was probably the hardest thing I ever done. And just there's a few people that probably, well, the younger generation perhaps, like we were talking about Charlotte today in the office. <laughs> <laughs> she's only 20 years old but just talk me through what the Kosovan war was about I've, I've done some research myself on it actually and it's, it, were, it was a, a horrendous war um, when it was, you think about it especially yeah, it was, what happened it, with the mass genocide as yeah. well well it was linked to the, the Yugoslavian separation and, and civil war that happened um, and Kosovo was a, an area of Serbia that it was very heavily populated by Albanians mm -hmm. and, um, and basically the Serbians didn't like them um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a lot of history involved in there, mm. but, you know, to, to grind it down, they didn't like each other. Um, and there was a big thing that, that the Serbians were kind of, we knew that they were in there sort of ruling with an iron fist, and it was decided that the civil war was too much. We went in as a peacekeeping force, but, um, you know, there's a few bits and pieces went on, but effectively there was a, an agreement made by the UN that, that the Serbian troops would pull out and, and have, you know, three, uh, three stages of withdrawing from Kosovo. And um, and as we went in, obviously we started trying to do a bit of um, 
rebuild the infrastructure because there's a lot of damage bombings and your warfare it, it, it wrecks stuff so um, when we went in and started to do that that's when we started finding the mass graves and and obviously at 20 years old and you're mm. pulling bodies and, and things out of holes and just just witnessing that much death and destruction mm. and he kind of there's a naivety to you that you know this can't this is real you know this is what we should be doing but you know then at the end of the day you know you reflect you think yeah, that is what i've just done mm. today so and it was a, a horrendous time i mean just talk to me through sort of how did how did that have a big impact in affecting you immediately or was it over time or is it still over time because not many people when we talk about mass graves world war Two and and the, the 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 nazi camps are probably the last thing from there and then to see that in kosovo as well i only see this sort of stuff on films yeah and the, uh, for some reason i've really got into history lately and i don't know why but it, it almost intrigues me but it's, it's 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 the shock that people can do that to other people but then seeing people like you that go to war it's something that me personally i don't think i've got the the balls to do it but i think it's one of those things that i think we, we don't know what we're truly capable of until we've tested yeah um, and we're all like that um but yeah see when, when like you say it, it, you've got to imagine it it's, it's all encompassing like say so you see it on the movie it's just mm. it's just visual images with some music you know to, mm. to set the mood but it's everything the, the air is tacky mm. it's, there's a smell there's a taste to the air you know it, mm. the, the whole thing encompasses every one of your senses mm. um, and, and like I say a lasting legacy of it at the time you're kind of just getting on with it you, you put it to the back of your head a bit and then when you come back and you start thinking about it and then and the nightmares happen and so you turn to drink, you think we can't sleep very well, so mm. I'll, I'll have a few drinks. And then you eventually learn to bury it. Um, when unfortunately, you know, when you start burying stuff and not talking about it, it will come back later and kick you in the ass. So, and that's when I had the PTSD stuff that I've got now is, is linked back to then mm -hmm. and not dealing with it at the time. Um, so it was, it was strange because when I, came, I remember coming home, so it was six, seven months out there and I came back home and and we quite we think we're quite important in the world <laughs> especially in our own little world we, we yeah. think we're quite central to what goes on and, and it was really strange that I came back and after being in that horrific sort of situation for, for six months mm -hmm. and I came back and the world had quite happily moved on without me mm -hmm. um, it kind of it made you sort of realise your own unimportance and mm -hmm. that's a horrible thing to learn mm -hmm. um, and it was that was kind of made me um not a good person and I, I was angry with the world and I'd go out to pick a fight and, and it wasn't to hurt someone else it was just just to get beat up really mm. but unfortunately at the t well fortunately which is the way we look at it I was quite young and strong at the time so I didn't I didn't mm. lose too many but that you know that was the thing I was so angry at the world mm. and that was my basis but I was still I was, I was still burying it and it was harder at home because I couldn't talk to people or felt mm. I couldn't talk to people at home and I couldn't wait to get back to camp because at least these people could relate to you yeah and, and they were all going through it as well so mm. although what what we do in the military which is really bad is, is we, we we turn everything into a humorous situation mm. because that's the easiest way to deal with it because by making it funny you derealize it mm. and and then that because it's not realistic anymore it doesn't hurt as much 